so this part is a question and answer panel. Uh, so we've got a range of experts um, and their respective sectors. Uh, and the directive that I've kind of given them is, is for each of them to spend between five and seven, five-ish, five to seven minutes each. Just kind of giving you a brief introduction to who they are, the context and sector, and uh, the kind of issues, issue or issues that they're having to confront uh, in relation to their sector. Um, so rather than me introduce and then it be reiterated, I will, I will pass it over. So if we take uh, Joel first, and then just kind of move, move that way. So over to you, sir, if you, if you take this away. <laughs> Thanks, Craig. Um, my name's Joel Petrie. I'm very local. I work in City Liverpool College, which is multi-sited, but one of the sites is literally 100 yards that way. Um, I've been there quite a long time. In fact, when I started, it wasn't called the City Liverpool College, it was called Liverpool Community College. And I think that change articulates one of the things which has been catastrophic about the education sector. Um, the name changed about three years ago when we had a, a significant changes of um, senior management. Um, I think the change was was well intentioned. It was it was supposed to be about um, engaging more successfully in entrepreneurial um, dynamics, encouraging local businesses to think of the college as being something that was critical to the success of the local economy. Um, it, it happened at the same time as the college joined the Gazelle Group, uh, which some of you will be aware of is uh, an organisation that's very much about encouraging entrepreneurial um, stuff in colleges. Um, anyway, so so with the whole college was, was we were three line whipped to go to a meeting, and it's, it's a big college, so there's a lot of staff. Um, and they didn't have a big enough room in the actual college estate, so they hired the Philharmonic Hall, which is not far from here, um, and it packed the rafters with staff. Um, now, the Philharmonic Hall normally has music, but every now and again they have, they have films, uh, they're usually old films, and they have this um, screen that comes out the floor, like on, on some kind of mechanism, it's a really enormous screen, and if you ever get the opportunity to go, you must, because they also have a Wurlitzer organ, which comes about the floor, and this elderly bloke comes on and sits and plays cheesy Blackpool-type songs whilst doing this. He's happy as a pig and shit, this guy. <laughs> so we went, and so, so, so we all sat down, the lights went down, pitch black, the lights came up on the, on, the, on the stage, and the new senior management team came on. So we're in the dark at this level, and they're in the light at that level. And that also tells you one of the things which has been catastrophic about what's happened to FE in the past 20 years or so since incorporation. So the PowerPoint came on. Now, you've never seen anything like it. A PowerPoint that size is really quite overwhelming, or well in almost, actually. And the image that they chose to talk about the new vision for the college was an image of a gazelle being savaged by a cheetah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I kid you not. Um, so part of the presentation was about the fact we were going to join gazelle. I think that was the link. Um, and the phrase that was used in relation to this image was, as a college we need to be fleet of foot. So in that that fucking gazelle's not been very fleet. <laughs> it's going down. So the massive, massive gazelle cheetah. And I'm sitting next to this old guy. Not, not rude to him, but he was, he's the old school, very close to retirement, trade unionist, um, politics lecturer. Um, and he's looking at this. And he's like, what? He's like, what? <laughs> so anyway, so, so there was this, I won't bore you with the whole of the vision. It was fairly lengthy. But the end of the vision was that we, essentially we had to think about ourselves in a completely different way. We had to think about, about our relationship to the community and to business in a different way. And the final line of the presentation was, colleagues, today is year zero. Wow. So, so my politics, I'm thinking that's vaguely familiar. So the, the guy sitting next to me, the politics lecturer, says, Jesus Christ, first we get the iconography of National Socialism, and then we get the rhetoric of Pol Pot. I'm out of here. <laughs> um, 
Am I being recorded? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, well, I will give you kind of editorial reads. Or... <laughs> <laughs> Don't publish any of it. <laughs> so, so it's been a bit of a journey since then, really. Um, I'm not going to talk about the problems of the sector, actually. I'm going to talk... Everyone knows what problems of the FE sector in particular, or HG2 to a, to a slightly lesser extent, I would argue. Um, actually, I think year zero is now for FE. And I think it's now because there's nothing further that can happen to FE now. It's at a rock bottom. It's at a point of existential crisis, in my view. In the budget this week... There was £420 million found for potholes and no pounds found for further education. And I have a sense that, that, I have a little bit of a sense that things get darkest before dawn. And I really, I actually am quite optimistic about further education. I think that things are shifting a bit. I think that the way we're seeing people like David Hughes, AOC, um, saying some really very radical things. I didn't realize. I've met him a couple of times. He's quite nice. I didn't realize he was trotting on the on the QT. Because he's, I mean, look, if you look at some of the things he's been saying, follow him on Twitter. Astonishing that somebody from the AOC is saying those things. And I'm basically saying enough is enough. And I'm going to now just very briefly, um, in, a, in, a, in a bit of massive personal hubris, read you the last paragraph of um, the introduction to a book that I co-edited with Professor Kevin Orr and Moya Daly a few years ago called Further Education and the Twelve Dancing Princesses. And we call it that because um, the, 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 the metaphor that's used most consistently about further education is that it's the Cinderella sector. It doesn't get to go to the ball um, it, it, and all the rest of it. I mean, it, it it's, if you start looking for it, you see it everywhere. It's, it's in academic literature. It's in, it's in um, TES on a regular basis, the Cinderella sector. And my lovely colleague, Moya, and this was the genesis of the book, said, you know what, I've always really hated that. I've, she's, she's, a, she's a radical, very radical left-wing feminist. She said, I've always hated it, not so much because it's a deficit metaphor, but because it's gendered as well. And it's all about, um, and I think this links in with the, the keynote, actually. Um, it's all about waiting for our prince to come. It's all, it's all about somebody else sorting it out for us. And she said, it shouldn't be about that. It should be about our own agency. So she said, there's another grim story, and it's the 12 Dancing Princes, and what's nice about it is although they're repressed by a, a not particularly groovy father and locked away every night, what he doesn't realise is that they've got the secret passageway and they go to a glade and dance all night. And what I like about that is that although they're in a repressive context, they're still <coughs> finding ways of, of having agency. And she said, you know, it's all very well OTL and all the rest of it, but actually as, as, as teachers, once the door of the classroom is closed... <coughs> We have a great deal of power, even in repressive contexts. And that's what they're doing. And they're doing it together. It's also collective, what they do. So, so can FE live happily ever after? If the sector is to be grim, it should be so on our own terms as powerful democratic dancing professionals. Warner, Marina Warner, who, whose work I love, argues that fairy tales can act as fifth columnists, defying existing structures while proposing alternatives. They offer magical metamorphoses to those who open the door, who pass on what they find there, and to those who hear what the storyteller brings. The faculty of wonder, like curiosity, can make things happen. It's time for wishful thinking to have its day. That's Warner, 1994. And I would argue it's time for the sector of the Dancing Princesses to have its due, and for Effie's cinders to be reignited. Sure. If I can suggest uh, staying with the FE theme, so if I can invite uh, Colette to uh, say a few bits. Yeah, okay, so I'm Colette, Colette Maudsley uh, from Hubert College, so I'm in Dean of Higher, Higher Education there. Pretty similar uh, story, so I will maybe just touch on. Uh, um, the uh, college higher education and, and our challenges, uh, our threats and uh, the opportunities that uh, are laid out in front of us. Not too dissimilar, our college um, had a transformation around about six years ago with new principal um, in post and we started to grow our HE provision. Prior to that, it was very low key um, in terms of everything, literally everything. 
um, we sort of grew in, and we were around about 500 uh, full-time um, and some part-time teacher ed students. And we range from uh, sort of foundation entry up to top-up courses. Um, the, the, the sort of key challenges that, that we face, I suppose, in terms of uh, scholarly activity um, we, we traditionally are not research-based. I mean, I think everyone knows that. We don't put in bids because we haven't got time to put in bids. We, we don't have um, the luxury of buying in someone to put a bid in for us. Uh, so they're, they're a lot of the, the sort of constraints. Our agenda is very much the WP agenda. You know, those students locally who um, may not have the opportunity to go to university and don't have the traditional qualifications and there's still those barriers to go to HEIs, we embrace that and that's what we do. Um, so, you know, on top of that, um, our staff are recruited from FE traditionally. We don't necessarily get um, staff coming in uh, from any other area. You can get one or two coming in. Uh, but they are staff that will develop courses, uh, you know, write those courses, move into the HE arena, and they haven't had that same opportunity. Uh, you know, we we moved, we're starting to move from a CPD um, element of scholarly activity into scholarly activity now, and that's starting to become recognised and has become recognised over the last couple of years. Uh, but traditionally, you know, when we go through all, all the PCRs, etc. It is all about research and form practice. And, and that is where we are starting now to come about. Um, and we, I suppose, have got the luxury of having a, a principalship in place who is allowing us to do that. Um, so a new research scholarly uh, policy has been written. Uh, we are now starting to work with Craig um, in terms of opportunities. And I think the challenge is trying to get the staff mind shift to go from, well, I just come in and I teach, to, oh, you want me to do research now? Well, what do you want me to do? Well, I haven't got time to do it. And it's all of those challenges that we face in, in FE. Uh, you know, the 23-hour teaching um, against, well, when am I going to have time to do that? So we, we've sort of looked at um, the, um, the good, the, the, bear with me, uh, the Hefke Good Practice Guide in terms of scholarly activity, and that's what we're trying to push out to staff. And slowly we are starting to get some staff that are coming in. And if I'm honest, it tends to be staff who are proportional and that's part of their living, if you, if you like. You know, we've got some staff who have um, been successful in research bids for their own practice. And, and that's our challenges, is, is the mindset of the staff, because we've now got the management team on board and we know the direction we need to go in. And obviously, I mean, you know, all of that comes down to what's actually happening in the classroom. And that's the most important thing. So for us, the opportunity is about um, obviously meeting like-minded um, colleagues that work in FE. And I know there's quite a few here today and embracing all of those challenges with HE, which I think is starting to break down those barriers. You know, we have barriers of their FE where HE were in a different building but over the road we think we're other and I think over the years there's been very much that FE, HE sort of oh you're FE, you're, you're FE but I think those challenges and barriers are starting to be broken down now which is really good so really that's that's where we're sort of coming from so for us it's about starting from the bottom now and having um, opportunities to work with colleagues to try and bring in that scholarly activity so that we can then um we can give the opportunities back to the staff and obviously pu push that back into the classroom. Thank you. Brilliant. Right, so then, so if Alex goes next, then Paul, um, then Sarah. Um, see how that goes. Okay, hello. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Alex and I'm totally skinned. Uh, <laughs> I live in a society that sees me through lenses of money, and I have no money. Therefore, it doesn't really see me. So I started <coughs> trying to provide the answers I needed to survive, psychologically, emotionally, and, you know, survive physically. Uh, so as a, as a response to... Well, well, where do I start listing the problems? You know, 
let's let's look at our society. Um, I've I've written an answer, and that's how I'm attacking the problems with answers. So Hannah Arendt emphasizes the changes in society and culture that increasingly structure our experience in the world, ourselves, and of each other. Aaron shows that a fundamental propensity of human of the human being is to long for a place in the world and to seek to create one through political action. The place is not an abstract category, but a very fundamental component of human life. She shows that consumerism offers only a false promise of a place in the world, delivering alienation and what Aristotle calls the loss of polity, leaving us either a beast or a god. Umberto Eco describes one of the four elementary phenomena of advanced cultures in in kinship relations as the primary nucleus of institutionalized social relations. I read this as sitting at the origin and center the organizing principle of our institutions. These are the relationships as described by our behaviors of and with our kinsfolk, chosen and inherited. So when someone asks me what I think of education, this is what is resident in my mind and in my heart, as it is something which is felt and about feeling as much as thinking. Education is about human development, the human development I need, we need. Education is about what makes a home, and as such, it is not just the house, the bricks and mortar, which shield us from the elements, the land which provides us sustenance. It is about the collective soul which helps animate us, society and what comes through companionship. When someone speaks to me of buying or selling these precious things, these incalculable wealth and abundances, I know that they have not got it. I know that they don't know what they're doing. I know I enter into such... Uh, well, why, why would I enter into such a mercenary relation with all that I hold dear? Why would I pollute and ransack a garden which provides me with succor, prosperity and delight? Immanuel Kant warned us of entering into such instrumental arrangements when writing about what constitutes ethical relations. We have forgotten that money is simply a promissory note, a covenant agreed between two people. It is merely a token of trust and honour in arrangement. These things neither neither would I put into finance to abstract and extract from my relations. I'm neither a consumer nor to be consumed by such an empty, non-reciprocal culture which externalizes the responsibility I have to my companions, my society and my environment. The true wealth is to be found in that responsibility. The abilities I develop to respond to the world and circumstances I am a part of. The wellspring from which consciousness arises. By consuming the world, we diminish ourselves. We engage in an act of cannibalism. We diminish each other. Instead, I have chosen to build to be a part of education, unconditional, ripe and sweet. Everyone is a university, a unique and distinct body of knowledge, accredited by their life experience and with a membership of one. So returning to one of my favorite authors, Hannah Arendt again. I love the the veracity she approaches things with. Education is the point at which we decide whether we love the world enough to assume responsibility for it, and by the same token, save it from that ruin which, 
except for renewal, except for the coming of the new and young, would be inevitable. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Alex. Paul? Oh, I'll stand with you, don't mind. Uh, Somebody at the end of the plenary asked the question about whether or not these were incremental changes or whether these incremental changes were part of a more systematic change. And the odd thing is, we experience these things as incremental changes. We experience different metrics and amended metrics and research excellence frameworks and TEF as incremental changes. But isn't it odd how over the past 40 years all these incremental changes have led us in one direction? One would almost think there was a strategy behind it. And of course, in our everyday work, we deal with new targets, new metrics, being measured by whether our graduates uh, are in graduate professions or postgraduate studies six months later, being measured by good degrees, being measured by good qualifications. And in all of those metrics and those everyday occurrences, what happens is we are bound up in them and don't see beneath them. And the real threat and challenge is beneath them. It's the deep commodification of the relationships we have. It's the deep commodification of a whole generation of students who are brought up, not as I was, to think that going to university with a grant means there is intrinsically something that I should give back, but that relationships are measured in commodities. They're measured in quantities. The transmutation from quality to quantity. Likewise, increasingly alienated, both staff and students, from each other as we compete, as we're set up to compete with each other. Alienated from the product we produce, increasingly managed and quality assured by people whose job is to rescue the institution from the dangerous radicalism of people who actually do academic work, Certainly from the process where we're constantly interrogated about how we teach, where we're constantly introduced to new techniques, all of which oddly involve a greater cost-benefit ratio to the institution and students getting less genuine time with staff and more self-directed study. And of course in the FEHE sectors, a growing class antagonism where colleges are devalued, college educations are devalued, and F- FEHE interfaces are used to remind universities that there are cheaper competitive models elsewhere, so you better get your acting gear. Now, if some of you recognize the framing that I'm using here, you'll also recognize the term hegemony, whereby which you manufacture the consent of those who are being ruled where you make them complicit. And the other challenge for me is to recognise that if many of us put a mirror up to our face, we see elements of complicity because we play this game as well as we suffer from it. Now, in part, we're compelled to play this game. In part, this game is our habitat. This is where we are. But at the same time, our mental health is diminished, our students' her mental health is diminished, our students are impoverished, our relationships are impoverished. Those who climb up the slippery slope, those who previously had integrity and authenticity in their teaching, become managers who all too conveniently forget what that was like and look only at their spreadsheets and their increasing pay packets. The threats are that these deep processes are not recognised and the challenges are the level of complicity. When the most successful UCU strike is about pensions and is right to be so, but nevertheless is about the naked self-interest of the staff and not about the gender balance, which is disgraceful, not about casualization of staff, not about the impoverishment of students and their suffering, then if we're going to be serious about politics, not only do we need to engage, we need to look in the mirror and decide which side we're on. And in that respect, I'm reminded of Raymond Williams' Marxism and Literature, page 112, where he talks about hegemony. And he says, hegemonies are never stable. They are constantly remade. But then he also reminds us, because they're constantly remade, they can be constantly subverted. And we subvert in two ways. 
Craig's book talks very much about tactics and strategies. It's about collectively coming together and both fighting for good conditions, proper education, using our intellectual clout to say we manage the curriculum, we say what's in the degrees, we say how. But also there's every bit subversive tactics, such as being exemplars to our graduate students, supporting junior staff, having integrity. Sometimes those of us, structurally white, middle-class, heterosexual, able-bodied men, should sometimes be stepping aside and saying it's someone else's turn to be promoted, someone else's turn to get more money, someone else's turn to be in the limelight. That's the opportunities we have, and when we build on those opportunities, quite by accident, one day we might find there's enough of us and some in senior positions to actually constitute an opportunity. And last but not least, I honestly don't know that I have anything useful to the collective that isn't that, in the sense of like, I, and, and everything that everyone said. Um, I, I feel like these are such yeah. important and accurate descriptions. Fine and dandy. Um, yeah. Is that okay? I really, like, all the things that I had written down to say have already been articulated better than I could say them. <laughs> um, the only thing I can say on the other side is just that uh, perhaps um, in the organisation of this opportunity that's just been described, um, some of the challenges are around our sort of lack of intelligibility to, to ourselves and other people mm-hmm. as we're working in this new space. But to be honest, I really just think everyone has said Excellent. what I want to talk about. Right, right. So it's, you, you have your panel of experts of various sectors and experiences. Um, so we've, you know, we've got roughly kind of 20, 25 minutes again, of uh, question, answer, discussion time. So if any, uh, any of you have any questions specific to a particular member of the panel, or if you want to ask a question generally, and um, we'll just see what kind of responses come from that. So, Peter. Um, um, this is general to all, to all of you, I think, in terms of... Um, Joel, you did mention it in your part, but you did mention it up there about uh, democratic professionalism. And Paul, the stepping aside, makes sense to me. But I wonder how you feel individually or collectively, individually, how necessary institutions are, and if they're so ingrained in being part of the problem, is there a new way of thinking required in a space beyond them? And I've even I've asked you that question, and a lot of people that I go to for for uh, inspiration, look at Paolo Freire, Henri Giroux, uh, Rosie Bredotti and the Post Human, I know that they're all saying that the institutions are absolutely essential, and it drives me bonkers, and I wonder if you think too that the institutions are absolutely essential, and if so, how do they distance themselves from the fact that they uphold the system that we're saying needs altering? Both, I would say. Um, instead, institutions aren't going to go anywhere. So it's, it, I think it's about trying to make them closer to the sort of things that, that, that we're talking about. Um, I, think, I think a good example in FE is, is, is you talked about professionalism. Um, so we had, we had some years ago um, this, this idea, which actually came out of the trade union movement uh, originally. This is, this is forgotten. But the Institute for Learning, which was the professional body for FE, was a NAPVI invention, actually, originally. And, and some of the key people who were involved in, in, in the first instance were NAPVI activists. Um, and it was, on paper, looked like it was going to do some really quite interesting things. It was going to be completely democratic and, and all, all the rest of it. Um, it wasn't the least bit democratic, ultimately. Um, and it ended up being... In my view, and I know some of the people involved, and I'd say it if they were here, a, a cabal of individuals sort of controlled that organisation and made it into something which was not anything like the vision that originally was articulated. It was not democratic. It was things like 
mechanistically logging your CPD online, nothing about the quality of the CPD, nothing about how transformational it was, just logging it and, a, and, a, and a, a, an arbitrary number of 30. Um, having said that, and you know, and we all know it collapsed and all the rest of it, but and we've now got the, 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 the ETF version, the Society for Education and Training, I think it's called, which has got about 20,000 members. The IFL had 200,000 members because it was mandatory. Um, I think there's a place for something like a professional organisation. I'd prefer it to be within the trade union movement, to be honest, and, and, and two things to be, to be you know, um, it's not exactly synonymous, but, um, but things like paying conditions, which are a massive issue in, in, in further education, the, having, having collective, um, having a, a, articulating a collective, powerful voice in that kind of institutional way, something like a professional body, is actually potentially a very good thing. Um, I don't think that's happening at the minute, but I think it is potentially a good thing. So that kind of that kind of formal structural thing has a, has a role, I think, and can be um, entirely po- positive. On the other on the other side of the coin, um, several people in, in this room are, are involved in, in tutor voices, which was something that um, a number of us um, established, which is which is which is very much anti anti what had happened with the IFL and, and very much democratic and rhizomatic and 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 free and all those sorts of things. And that kind of that kind of thing, which, which could never um, shift government policy or, or, or articulate a case for better pay conditions, <coughs> has also got a role, I think. It's neither one nor the other. Two examples. Let's stop denigrating college courses. Uh, one of the things that worries me slightly within FE HE interfaces is the extent to which the HE interface suddenly becomes the place everybody wants to be because FE is just a grind. Why don't we evaluate the courses people do and stop selling lots of kids who don't need and don't want degrees, degrees? So actually, in that, in that respect, there's in, it's recognising institutions for different purposes. But in order to keep institutions honest, you have to have things outside. I mean, you know, I, the, the sort of networks I run try to actually do this internationally and try to bring people together and have a respect <coughs> for students and early career researchers. And when those networks are established and when they have a certain degree of respect and when they play the game to a certain degree, they can keep some universities honest in the way the Workers' Education Association used to keep some universities honest, in the way the Open University used to be honest before it started appointing vice chancellors who were business magnates or biased BBC. So in that respect, it's not about abandoning institutions. And I think for areas you are of the same opinion. It's not about abandoning them. It's about working from the outside to actually keep them honest and then working from the outside, inside incrementally to actually start to move them, at least at the edges, towards where we want to be. And if the edges pull, maybe the centre will gravitate as well. Yeah. Uh, my question really is to all of you, and I think it relates to aspects of what everybody's saying. We are a sector, I feel, that has amazing things happen, transformation, transforming stories behind closed doors in tiny rooms, and these things are never articulated. Similarly, the HEIP interface, amazing new types of scholarly work. You know, we have FV research, it's called the grey literature. We have a real problem with how we storytell our sector. And speaking to Joel's point about the fairy tale, the myth, how, how can we together story tell our sector better so that it's not marketized sort of story, so that it's not a story that is given to us by an external organization that we have to take? There's a, there's a, there's a move at the minute to establish a, I don't like the term particularly, but the term that's being used in the meta network, um, and the person who's been quite a Quite a prime mover behind it is um, Norman, can't remember his second name, the ATL, now in NEU, um, National Official for FE. Um, anyone, anyone help me, Crowder. Norman? Crowder. Norman Crowder. So the, 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 the idea, I think, is to, try and, is to try and pull together things like the Association for Research and post compulsory Education, TEL, Teacher Education and Lifelong Learning Network, the Learning and Skills Research Network. Um, you, you're quite right, there's, 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 
It's a myth that there isn't very much research going on in FE, actually. There's lots of research going on in FE. There are lots of people doing master's degrees. There are lots of people doing PhDs and educational doctorates. But they tend to disappear back into their institutions. The thesis goes into the bottom <coughs> of the drawer. They don't go and talk about it. They don't publish it. And it languishes. Um, and that's, that's a major issue, I think, because we're, we're, all, all those interesting stories are, are, are just occluded and, and, and dissipate. So I'm quite optimistic that, 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 that this is something that's going to happen. There, there are people involved in it... Um, there are some strange bedfellows in it. So the, the, the ETF is very, very interested in it. The, uh, David Russell, who runs the ETF, is very interested in this. Uh, it needs to be not something that ends up being owned. I'm not having to go at the ETF, but it, need, it, doesn't, it needs not to be owned by the ETF. It needs to be something that's, that's that ideally it would be something that, that sits somewhere else. But I think there's quite a lot of energy at the moment being put into trying to um, find a way of, of doing exactly what you're saying. I'd speak back to that because I'm part of that. Right. So I'm a very quiet part. Um, the part I am is actually trying to manage a web presence. Now, I'm not a web designer, but one of the reasons I want to put myself voluntarily into that role is because that isn't an own role. That means that the web presence can be collaborative. It's not being subsidised or sponsored. It will probably look far worse because of that. But perhaps more of the collective way you use it in scope. I can try to feed it back through. Um, I, I'm really interested in trust. It, it was the question, I think your response that mentioned trade unions, Joel, that got me thinking about it, but I'm thinking about it all the time. I'm really inspired by Les Christine and Christina's work around trust and um, organisations have lack trust. And I like trust in organisations. Um, and I just wondered what the panel's <coughs> thought, thoughts were on whether that can be overcome, and if so, how? How do we build trust? I've got a, I've, a response to that. I think um, there's some very, very interesting work being done by Christina Donovan. Uh, and I also think we need to societally have an understanding of the dehumanization psychology, the infrahumanization psychology that is being done by weights and colleagues. Um, it used to be thought that dehumanization processes would happen when you othered, but there's a whole collection of uh, research now showing that it you don't need to necessarily other, you can just be in your own group and there's a natural process whereby uh, outgroups occur and appear. I'm not sure if our society can progress. We can progress as a species without understanding how our psychology is working at that base level and undermining extending past uh, only trusting ourselves. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's brought two things together in my head because I knew that the concern about trade unions space thing and the trust thing, I knew they were in my head in the same space and I couldn't make the connection. And just to say that the connection for me is, uh, you know, really back to something Sarah said about they can get rid of us, they can sack us, they can make us sick, they can uh, demoralise and discredit us. And, and, and that's because I, I call out HR in using dehumanizing practices within the organization that actually trade unions don't have the skills to address and who does. Yeah, thank you. That's just, I need to write some things down. Thank you. Sarah, the <coughs> Yeah, I think that's an important point. And also sort of in terms of what has been said about the incremental changes that are sort of a, a part of a larger or evidence of the larger project, um, that the skills, and we don't have the regulatory legal framework for engaging those things actually in terms of trade unions, so that's a really interesting point. Um, just to, the, the I wanted to really support this idea of storying um, and restoring as a way of, 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 of claiming a, a profession for itself um, that is outside of the logics of performativity um, and even of, of marketing. 
Um, and I, I, I think that that kind of project as a, a practice of a concrete utopia, as a, as a means of actually reconstructing a profession for itself, um, would be very useful. Um, just very briefly, in case people aren't aware of it, the work that, um, that Rob Smith in, in, in um, BCU and Vicky Duckworth in Edge Hill are doing, which is a UCU-funded project called um, FE Transforms. There's a, there's a website, and there are, there are, I don't know, there must be hundreds now of videos of, of students, parents, tutors, senior managers, um, employers talking about the, tra- the transformational um, power of further education. It's, it's a it's a really really a, quite an amazing resource. My only issue with it, and and, uh, and I've told um, Vicky and Rob this, is that FE doesn't transform. Actually, it's an incredibly important thing, and it's and it's massively significant. But I've I've had hundreds of students go through my hands in in a building over there. And they're just as clever as the students, um, the kids who go to a school about one mile that way. And in the school one mile that way, at least four or five people go to Oxford and Cambridge every year. And not one single student has ever gone to Oxford or Cambridge from, from um, the college, to my knowledge. That's not to say that Oxford and Cambridge is great, but it doesn't transform in the way that sometimes it's, it's suggested it transforms. And I think we, we need to be clear about that. If it's to be transformative, other things need to happen. Can I, can I, sorry, if I bring Sarah. Um, yeah, I'm um, really interested in the kind of the interface between collective action and individual action and what we can actually do as individuals um, and the impact of one on the other. I kind of, I'm a branch deputy here at John Moore's Un- University of the UCU, um, although I don't think, you know, the UCU structures as they exist can change things, but I think it's very, very difficult for academics um, of any sort to really resist any of the changes on an individual basis because of the pressures that we're under every single day at work. You know, there'll be, Stephen Ball talked about this notion of academic refusal, which is very individualised and actually I think almost impossible to do. You know, people get pulled into the ref, they get pulled into, you know, the TEF, they get pulled into having to, you know, publish or be damned. Um, because you can't, it's not, people talk about the embodiment of, of the ideal university in us, but I think it's in a, us as a collective body rather than uh, making an individual difference at the moment. And that's all about temporality as opposed to um, what I'd like to see and what's possible. I think, you know, many years ago, it was very, very, very different. Um, so I'm kind of interested in, in that notion that the kind of difference between really academic refusal and academic resistance, well, I think one gives us more agency than the other. Can I just add a bit of a caution here and perhaps disagree with it? <coughs> I mean, you, you, when we talk about complicity, you see you as a paradigm case. And I speak as someone who was a UCU officer at my university for about 15 years. Uh, a, a leadership which are so keen on kowtowing, a president who doesn't think that she's accountable to her members. Uh, and in that respect, there is a sense that both the union as a structure is no means of resistance, except individual and individual universities in some parts. But also, there is a high level of complicity because people live within their disciplines and fields as opposed to seeing themselves as a coherent group of staff. So you get a situation where, with the research excellence framework at universities, there was a very real opportunity and window for academics to simply say no, but they didn't. And then, in any bar, in any town with a university, you will find three or four academics coming together saying, isn't it terrible? And then going to their desk and grading other people's work on a scale of one to four. That, to me, is very complicit. And that's why trust is so difficult, because we have a history of that. And that relates, in a way, to your point, because it's not that the stories aren't good. But when you live in a world where quantity is valued over quality, it's not the quality of the story, it's how it can sell. And if it can sell in terms of money or prestige. So I regularly told publishing journals, which effectively only 10 people read, for God's sake, don't publish in these things that lots of people read, but incidentally haven't got status. And in a sense, 
we have been part of making that so. And it's a big wrench to turn around to your managers and say, look, I publish what I want, I do what I want, uh, I, I achieve in other metrics, and what we should be doing is letting a thousand flowers bloom. Mm. Uh, so, Joe, next. And, and... I mean, the point, the, the, uh, the point at which I was, I was going to intervene is sort of past, but... Oh, um, sorry. That's uh, fine. <laughs> I, I, I wanted to um, say something about the, the language that you were using and referring to and wanted to ask, why is it a word like transformation is being used about an educational endeavour? You know, you want to ask questions about, you want to question the idea that FE transforms, suggests that Oxford and Cambridge might transform. Another way of looking at it is to say, why are we using language like transformation? Do we not have to try and keep on reminding ourselves that we, we should be making efforts to tell stories in language which is appropriate to what education is or might be. And I'm not sure words like transformation do that. I think, picking up on what you just said as well, I'd also like to say that I think that one of the ways in which we can um, work across these very difficult spaces is that, uh, uh, is that we can try and do both. So if you get some publications in the sorts of journals that institutions want you to get publications in, and then you say, hmm. um, and now I'm spending the rest of my time doing this, <coughs> then uh, you know, you're using the power and the status that you do have productively. And you're also um, showing other people that other ways of doing things are possible. It's tiny, but it's something. Mm -hmm. I think the, um, the word transformational, I think, is being used in, in, in a very deliberate way by um, Rob and Vicky, and it's, and it's entirely political. Right. And they're, they're trying to articulate as, as clearly as they possibly can. And if you, if you follow either of them on Twitter, I, I think they must have like a performing monkey working for them because every about three minutes, Vicky is, is, is sending another one of these videos, um, videos out. Um, and it's a, it, it's absolutely about trying to, it's about leverage. They're trying to, they're trying to say, look, this is an incredibly important sector that does incredibly important things and it needs to be funded better. That's what it's doing. Um, but the real, the real word that's missing in the, in the, in the, um, discourse in relation to what they're doing and the reason why my students don't go to Oxford or Cambridge or Bristol or Durham or Edinburgh or St Andrews, um, and the students who go to the Bluecoat School down the road do go to those universities is class. Sure. And it's about the fact that the, 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 the kids coming to FE, and certainly in this city, and I think to a large extent across the sector, are coming from more socio-economically deprived backgrounds. That's why they're not going to Oxford Cambridge, not because they're not as clever. Yeah. Yeah. Why aspire to go to those places? Why aspire to go to those places? Well, that's, that, that, yeah, for sure. But, 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 for sure. But, you know, when, when, when you're in a situation where you have a... You have a a government um, which is made up largely of people who have gone to the same school, then we're in a difficult position, I suspect. Right, we're, we're almost at half past, but there's a couple of people that want to ask questions. So if, if we take the questions consecutively, uh, and then we've got time, uh, or whatever time allows, we'll only invite the panel to then respond. But then after that, we, if we kind of move up to the, uh, uh, the room where we're having lunch, we can continue in conversation. So... Thank you. Were next, and then and then George. Um, it's about this idea of transformation as well. Um, uh, in my experience, I teach, I teach critical studies and I teach art and design. A lot of my students don't want to be transformed. Uh, they don't want to think critically. Uh, they don't want abstract culture. They just want a job. And I think we've been speaking a lot about senior management and this sort of. Patriarchal hegemony, which we're sort of fighting against, but on, on the front line, as it were, I'm often fighting against students' um, uh, unwillingness to uh, be transformed or un un unappetite for critical thought. Okay, George, George. I'm just going back to the issue of trade unions. I think 
part of the problem that we need to recognise is that even within a union like the ECU, not um, all unions are equal. And um, having been in the ECU in the federal education institution, having been in uh, one of the higher, insti- higher education institutions, <coughs> And then seeing it in operation in the third higher education institution that's very much post 92, I can see that its operation is not equal and the support that is given to FE is not equal to the support that, and it's not entirely down to UCU, it's <coughs> partly down to the social and cultural capital of the members and what they're able to achieve. So, uh, you know, in some of the, in some of the division, but it's the, the degree of cultural and social capital that the electorates have means that they're able to be more effective in um, general practice. Um, Colette, do you want to, because you've, you've not responded yet, do you want to pick up on any of those? Uh, I think I totally agree. Uh, I think it is very difficult when you're in a, um, an FE institution and you're delivering HE, that is that fight against um, everywhere. The, the, every, we are fortunate that we have our own building, so we that the staff feel other and different. Um, but then you still fight against that in terms of um, other stuff, other colleagues thinking that you are other and different. Um, so that, that, that's, that's a barrier for us. But certainly in terms of the trade union, yeah, I can say it's very interesting for me to sit here and listen to all of this because I don't get that opportunity to, um, to talk to um, colleagues from universities that often because it is even, you know, sort of <coughs> high level. It's head down, get on with it. And before, before you know, it's Monday morning again. Um, pretty much like the staff go into, and it is all, all about in in, in um, HE and FE. Um, it's time. It goes back to what you were saying before. It is about time, and it is about that we were talking before about the luxury of having time to think, and we don't. We just don't, and and it does go back, you know, to what you're saying um, in terms of, um, you know, a certain listen, and and I think I didn't realise. The, um, the issues that you were having even as HEI institutions in terms of that um, research uh, and being almost uh, forced to do that research when, it, you know, we, we've always fought against staff saying, um, well, we want to do research, you just don't give us the opportunity to do that. And then when we give them the opportunity, they go, oh, we haven't got time to do that. And then we say, well, we can give you the time to do that. And they go, Oh, no, we don't want to do that because, we, <laughs> because you, we're going to have to bring in money. Well, what do you want then? So they want to be treated like um, HEIs, but then when you offer it to them, it, there is that um, resistance. And that, that's interesting. It is, is it resistance or is it learned helplessness? Probably. Yeah, very much. So, we need to finish, but I just want to, uh, Sarah, offer the opportunity to Sarah for a final few comments. Um, just to say that time, I think this has to be the beginning of a lot of our conversations. Time is, is, is always at the heart of labour struggle. And, 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 and this is like hugely important. And I, my guess would be about sort of resistance and learned helplessness. Something that some people might want is the. I can't speak about people who do that, but I don't know, actually. That'd be silly of me to try to do that. I know what I want in my situation is um, space and time to engage in inquiry that is not dictated by capitalist imperatives. So I think regardless of what time I have, I'm still struggling for something else. Um, I did want to think about also institutions. It's a very good question. I think there are lots of people who are constructing alternative institutions, and that's a very particular kind of project, and that is going on, and it's super important, I think. Um, and it's well developed in some places. For me, here in this context, I think it does go back to this, this idea of habitus and 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 the the, the conditions of our existence. Um, and I would love to be able to think of institutions as part of a, a larger ecosystem of things that is defined not by the institutional imperatives, but by the question of what is the what is the project and where institutions are useful for that and where they can be a site of struggle. Then great, we use them, and where they can't be, then we use something else in a strategic way. Um, you know, in what ways are they necessary and useful for this project of liberation? Um, and, and the question of students, I think it's such a good one. Uh, I think the same, for me, the same forces that are, that, are, that, are, that are shaping and driving what's going on with managers and what managers are doing, and I'm friends with a lot of people who are managers, uh, it, the same forces and, and, and things are shaping my students' desires, and they've come up through schools that are shaped by these forces and stuff. So I, I do think this, this, this is part of a big ecosystem 
Um, and I, so it's an important part. Can I just add one minor, just in response to your point? I don't think our job is to transform students. Our job is to enable them. The millennials have been brought up in an impoverished culture where fame is 15 minutes long and everybody has a go at reality TV. The odd thing is, I found in teaching, that when you introduce them to romantic poetry, when you introduce them to other cities, other countries, you take them on field trips, when you introduce them to other sources and you explain that you can do this just out of interest as opposed to for the focus off something, you find people want a lot more than just the gruel that they're being served at the moment, no matter how shiny that gruel appears to be. Uh, excellent. Many thanks, colleagues.